I'm Lisa Abramowitz. Welcome to Bloomberg Money Undercover, a show that provides valuable insights into alternative investments. We take you inside the world of private debt, equity, and real estate. Let's get straight to the burning issues in private markets. A dramatic battle playing out at WeWork. We dissect what it says about real estate as well as private versus public valuations. Plus, chaos at Thomas Cook, why hedge funds came out on top as part of the liquidation. And we'll also hear my conversation with hedge fund veteran and distressed debt investor Hans Humes. He dishes on Argentina, China, and the rest of emerging markets. Well, let's get into some of these burning issues. With me is Bloomberg's Katie Lenzel, Jeff Langbaum, and Shanali Basik. We start with Katie and Thomas Cook. Uh, Katie, not everyone lost out with this collapse. Some hedge funds stand to earn as much as $250 million from this bankruptcy. Please explain. Yes, so we know that while there are many people all over the globe who are very upset that Thomas Cook has gone into liquidation, there are at least some investors who are feeling pretty clever at this moment because they actually bought credit protection on Thomas Cook, seeing that this company didn't have a huge future ahead of it, seeing that at some point it was going to default, and they are actually set for a payday now. We know that across all of those who hold CDS, it's looking like about $250 million. Okay, and this is how the CDS, the credit default swap market, should work, that you bet on either side to either win or lose these hedge funds lost but is there a bigger reputational loss that stems from this gain at a time when 150,000 travelers are stranded outside of the United Kingdom? Well, we have seen certain cases in the CDS market where hedge funds have actually pushed healthy companies into default just to get a payout on CDS. It's important to say that in the case of Thomas Cook, that's not quite what has happened because the company fell into administration, into liquidation of its own accord. It needed an extra 200 million pounds, it said, at the weekend, and there was nobody who was willing to come forward and actually give the company that money. So these hedge funds have not caused the event, but they do stand to gain from it. Katie Lenzel, uh, th that is uh, bringing me to another story that's pretty big at the moment, which is private market uh, valuations. And to you, Jeff, WeWork has spurred a lot of angst in recent weeks. Here's a new warning. Boston Fed uh, President Eric Rosengren saying the company and general rise of co-working spaces presents a threat to financial stability. Please explain. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. Um, maybe eventually we get there, uh, but there is definitely an increased amount of risk to the commercial real estate markets. You have uh, what has become a very significant tenant, uh, especially in large cities like New York, San Francisco, um, and if all of a sudden they are no longer uh, occupying that space, that presents an impact to the landlords. Okay, so here's WeWork, right? They're having trouble with their IPO, uh, reportedly may ice it at the time, and we're hearing that uh, Adam Newman may be stepping down as chief executive officer in short order. What happens to commercial real estate values if there is real problem, uh, if there's a real problem at this company? Well, well the most immediate impact is they're going to have to slow their growth rate, and so that's going to uh, not allow them to lease new space um, and then continue to expand, and, and they've become like the, the tenant of choice for landlords looking to fill existing space. So that's going to be the immediate pullback. Uh, at, at that point, it really becomes down to whether or not there's a, a significant liquidity problem for them and whether or not they are solvent. Do you expect commercial property values to go down in the wake of some of the turmoil that we're seeing with WeWork? Not immediately, but if they have a major problem, then potentially. Well, that brings us to uh, WeWork's blame game, even though SoftBank's Masayoshi Sun is calling for a, the ouster of CEO and co-founder Adam Newman, despite having supported him for years and pouring billions of dollars into his business. Now there is a bigger question. Shanali, you have been all over this. Is the failed IPO Adam Newman's fault? Where should the blame be placed? Well, guess what the awkward question here is now on the eve of Adam Newman really stepping down here. We have SoftBank with a bigger stake in WeWork than Adam Newman himself has. And so you have a situation where SoftBank poured $20 billion uh, worth of evaluation in 2017, propped that all the way up to $47 billion at the beginning of this year. And even at that time, there are some whispers in the market if, if that was even too high. SoftBank had to downscale their investment at that time as well. And so now bring us forward now into this part of the year where you have potentially a $15 billion valuation and SoftBank is on the line uh, for uh, maybe a billion dollar write down according to Sanford Bernstein analysts. So no matter who the blame game is for here, SoftBank is getting quite hurt after this valuation has been inflated due to their investments. 
Nali, thank you so much. And to all of our reporters, we appreciate the insight. This all brings us to my guest, Len Sherman, Columbia Business School adjunct professor of business. Let's stick with WeWork, this idea of private versus public valuations. And I'm just wondering uh, whether WeWork's failed attempt at an IPO, at least so far, is indicative of overly inflated valuations in some of the private markets. Well, um, first, thanks for having me. Uh, I think that is the, the killer question. You know, it's, it's very easy to get caught up in this is the gift that keeps on giving the Adam Newman show and the, the latest kind of juicy reporting about, you know, what's going on in his behavioral quirks. But, you know, despite the fact that um, WeWork's uh, current whatever they can possibly get out to IPO re represents probably the biggest discrepancy between private and public valuations. There's been a broader trend going on that's been quite disturbing, you know, which has been referred to as blitzscaling, which is, you know, private venture capital investors awash in more capital than we've ever had before are investing unprecedented amounts of capital early in the game in companies with unproven business models. And we're seeing already the consequence of some of those blitz-scaled investments in companies like Uber uh, and, and Lyft and Slack and Cloudera that have uh, gotten billions of dollars of investment but are struggling since they've gone to IPO. So Len, in an article that you wrote for Wired, you wrote, spending too much too soon on unproven business models only heightens the risk that a company's race for global domination can become a race to oblivion. How does having more money accelerate the chances of failure? Well, the, the, the whole premise behind blitzscaling is that, uh, and SoftBank is probably the, the prime uh, driver of this trend, uh, is that uh, a company like SoftBank can pick a winner early in the game. They haven't, by any stretch of the imagination, proven that they have a viable and profitable and sustainable business model. And by pouring billions of dollars, picking the winner early in the game, that that amount of money alone could be the primary reason why that blessed company can pull away from the pack. And, and the presumption behind that is that capital constraints are uh, a real nuisance. And if we can somehow just remove that nuisance, uh, <clears throat> the chosen winner can come out and run away from the rest of the pack. But I just profoundly think that that's a flawed uh, strategy. So as somebody who has sat atop one of these tech startups, I'm wondering, do you have a sense of how high the overvaluation and how prevalent the overvaluation may be throughout the tech startup world that we're seeing today? Well, I think the, mar the market has already spoken. If you look at uh, companies in the last two years that have gotten a billion dollars or more of private equity investment for, through VCs before they IPO'd, uh, the vast majority, oh, and, and they've now IPO'd either in 2018 or year to date this year, the vast majority of those kind of highly invested in companies, blitz scale invested companies, are now trading under their day one IPO close. So the market is speaking that there is a considerable, depends on, uh, on the valuation. Lyft today, I think, is trading at an all time low, about half of what their day one close was. Uh, but Slack and Uber and several others are suffering by varying amounts anywhere from 5% to 50 percent so there you have it and just real quick do you think that'll continue right well as, as long as as this kind of blitz scale mania uh takes place uh i i think we'll see more of it len sherman thank you so much of columbia business school coming up we sit down with hedge fund veteran and distressed debt investor hans humes he tells us what emerging market investors are getting wrong we have a lot of people who are crunching spreadsheets and not a ton of people who are paying close attention to what's going on on the ground in these countries. I'm Lisa Abramowitz. This is Bloomberg Money Undercover. Now time for Power Player, our look at some of the most notable names in private markets. Investors are pouring record amounts of money into private debt and equity, and more of it is finding its way into emerging markets. In fact, even as fundraising has slowed down in developed markets, it's still actually accelerating in emerging economies. I spoke with Greylock Capital's Hans Humes, who has been a key player in numerous sovereign restructurings. We discussed this high investor interest in private investing in emerging markets. The wall of private debt and private equity market look, money looking at emerging markets is probably more a reflection of those ha having been successful strategies in the developed markets. But in the United States, you have a framework um, where if these things go wrong, there's a certain treatment under a bankruptcy code. You, if there is a 
default or chapter 11, um, people's the management's fiduciary duty start, goes from the shareholders to the creditors. Um, the, there is a, you know, the courts recognize the creditors are senior in the capital structure. Um, that doesn't exist in most emerging market countries. The courts, in fact, quite the opposite. The courts will be a bit more beholden to the shareholders and not to the creditors. So on the private debt side, more often than not, when you get into a difficult situation, the creditors can get wiped out and the equity holders come out holding um, you know, the company in some form. It doesn't happen all the time, but it, it is a risk. Have you been buying, actively buying Argentinian debt in the wake of the swoon with the IMF considering to uh, give them more money? So I kind of you know, have grown up in these crisis environments which may lead to a debt restructuring. Um, so if I'm not involved in Argentina, there's something wrong. And the fact is, we are completely involved. As soon as, it, as soon as the crisis started, which started really, I mean, there was this kind of gr gradual grind down um, in, in asset prices until the first round election, the PASO. Um, the gap that uh, Alberto Fernandez had over Mauricio Macri was much larger than anybody had predicted in the polls. Um, so I was on a plane to Buenos Aires before the week was out. And I went to talk to a lot of the people who work with Alberto Fernandez because those are the people that I sat across the table from negotiating the restructuring back in the mid 2000s. Um, the reason things sold off so heavily was the fear of these people coming in and reinstituting the policies of Nestor and Christina Kirshner. Um, what I can say is my takeaway is that's not their game plan by any means. They know they need market access. The, up, the economic possibilities of the country are dependent on market access and they know full well that they can't go scorched earth with creditors again in order to have that market access. So, that's a very long way of saying, yes, we've been buying. Okay, so which instruments do you find most attractive here? Because all Argentinian assets have sold, sold off. Sold off, yeah. Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're debt guys, um, and I'm a distressed guy, so the cheaper something's gotten, the better off. But uh, we've, we've been pretty prudent about deploying into some of the provincial debt, the city of Buenos Aires, which never restructured at all, uh, but also things on the sovereign curve. To China, this has been one area a lot of people are saying there are tremendous opportunities, especially in the distressed world, right. uh, particularly as the uh, PBOC and, and, and the party allows companies to default for the first time right. and actually have distress. Are you getting involved? Not yet. I mean, the prices haven't collapsed. We're seeing some spotty activity where things will gap down. We've gotten involved in a few things, but it's um, we're not China experts by any means. Uh, but anytime there's a crisis, it, you know, you sort of recognize the patterns. Um, the few attempts we made to really work on the ground there were, were difficult. There's a, you know, there's a real sense. I mean, any country, there's a sense that there's a bit of an insider's game in China. Clearly, it, it's very difficult to push back. One thing that's marked this post-crisis era has been an incredible amount of debt that's been sold around the world, but particularly in emerging markets. And we've seen this uh, from everywhere. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether you see an opportunity brewing for you who focuses on distress uh, it, at the next downturn, which could be sooner than, uh, than later, given the fact that people are <laughs> predicting some sort of recession globally by 2021. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, always a trick is when you get that kind of a turn. I mean, we have to stay invest, invested that um, we generally have historically done much better on the way up. So you take your mark to market hit. Um, yes, I, the short answer is yes. There's a wall of debt there. There. We don't need to be in the business of predicting the next crisis. Um, we just know that there always will be one and there's much more to play with <laughs> than there has been in the past. What do you think is the biggest thing that emerging market debt investors right now are getting wrong? Emerging market investors tend, very often the, the biggest blocks of money that move are tracking indices and are not paying very close attention to the, you know, the structure of the debt that they're buying. So there's a lot of change in the enforcement language in the bonds. So it comes, you know, you end up getting these weird curveballs, you know, something like in Argentina currently, if they do a reprofile that uses the aggregated collective action clauses, does that constitute an event of default? Um, so the lack of sort of 
deep knowledge on the structure and then also your point earlier so much of this is political and there we have a lot of people who are crunching spreadsheets and not a ton of people who are paying close attention to what's going on on the ground in these countries that was my conversation with Greylock Capital's Hans Humes. And you may not know, Hans is an ex-Frisbee player, an avid ski a skier, and a skydiver. Our own Matt Miller and Skylar Fu actually went skydiving with him. And speaking of skies, Climate Week is underway. That means some of the globe's most powerful corporate leaders are making pledges to be greener as heads of state gather in New York. From a business perspective, Ken Melman, the co-head of KKR Global Impact, told us there are returns to be had when addressing these types of problems. In the last 10 years, we at KKR have invested $5.2 billion in 32 companies through our private equity strategies mostly, and some of our infrastructure strategies. And you know what we found? That we can get great returns if we identify the right problems that need to be solved. Time now to our segment, College Cash. A look at the endowments. Harvard is the world's largest college endowment, and over the past decade, its 4.5% average annual return ranked last among other Ivy League schools. One struggle has been a $270 million bad bet on Brazil. Here to explain, Bloomberg's Michael McDonough. Michael, what happened here? Uh, well, uh, the, the story captures a, a moment in time, let's call it that. Uh, we, we, got, uh, we were very fortunate to get the audio uh, and a transcript for a conference call showing uh, the extreme desperation that Harvard had reached back in 2017 as this project was going off the rails and it was desperately trying to get out and sell anything it could. It, it made a, a very big bet on uh, farmland in Brazil, part of a series of bets it made around the world. And in this particular case, it, uh, the bet came up empty. All right, so uh, now it's been trying to get out of this bet. How big of a drag has this been on uh, Harvard's returns? Because it has been pinpointed as really the most notable laggard among its Ivy League peers. Yeah, Harvard had made a decision about a decade ago to really, really bet big on international agricultural developments, farmland, timberland. And uh, at first, I think that, you know, it got some decent returns. In the last few years, it's really proved to be disastrous. They had a massive write down back in 2017, about a billion dollars. They wrote down the size of the portfolio. They've been trying to desperately sell stuff. We're guessing from this, maybe somewhere in the $200 million range contributed to that billion dollar write down. So you can see here, this just lays out just the, the kinds of you know, risks that they were willing to take and the kind of downside that they, they felt when, uh, when something did not work out for them. What kind of liquidity is there for South American agricultural land? <laughs> you want to buy some? I mean, I'm just wondering, you know, is there, is there a secondary market for this? Uh, well, certainly, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a large market. There's a, a number of institutional investors. As you can see in the documents that we found, you know, when they were desperately trying to unload this farmland, they were contacting dozens and dozens of, of institutional investors, pension funds, money managers all around the world. You know, they couldn't find anybody. That doesn't mean that there's, there's not interest. I think that might also say something just about the location and the size of the, 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 the plots of land that they, these were massive, like five times the size of your average U.S. city, huge plots of land. So this was a really, really big bet. This was, this was the definition of illiquidity, I think you could say. Michael McDonald of Bloomberg News, thank you so much. Now to our billionaire beat. Uh, the world's richest families are stockpiling cash. A new report from UBS and Camden Research surveyed 360 global single and multifamily offices. Results showed about 42 percent are raising cash reserves here with us to explain. Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf, who joins from London. So, Tom, they're stockpiling cash. Just how much and just how prevalent is this sort of fear? Yeah, there's it's a real sense of doom and gloom, to be honest, coming out of this uh, admittedly typically conservative sector. So uh, alongside this report, we spoke to a few uh, family office managers, and, and they were really saying, from their point of view, that there's not much uh, sort of uh, up 
uptick really on, on any asset class. They think equities will fall and then stay flat. They think there'll be no real returns on bonds. Uh, and then an alternative investment is going to be really tricky to invest. So as you say, they're now um, sort of really uh, moving into cash. They're also deleveraging. And you know, when you put the sort of size of this family office market at about six trillion, that's, that's going to feed through to the markets. They're, they're a really important asset class. And, and what is striking is, is just how sort of pessimistic they are, particularly when you compare them maybe to the the average investor. So when you talk about alternatives, private equity, private debt, that has been sort of a stalwart in terms of performance uh, for these family offices and others, how bullish, bearish are they on this sector going forward? So that is the one space that, you know, they do love alternatives. I, I think when you include real estate with uh, private equity and hedge funds, that comes out to about 40% of their overall allocation. So that's a pr pretty uh, hefty pile, equities at about 30. Um, but the problem is, is you know, these returns, while they're probably the, the sector that outperformed the most, I think they got something like 15%. Uh, you know, that's a big decrease from the last few years they've been seeing. And also they're predicting, hey, this is not sustainable. And even for us, and these are the guys who manage money for billionaires, even for us, we're struggling to get the allocations we want in the funds we want. Yeah. So it's uh, even for them, it's a tricky situation. But are they allocating more or less to these strategies? Uh, they're, they're allocating. They're hoping to allocate more to private equity. But but the problem is 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 you know they only want to do that in the top tier of funds. So uh, you know most of them are sort of struggling to do that, and hence there's going to be an increase in the amount they have in cash. Um, that they're going to have sitting on the sidelines. Tom Metcalf. Thank you so much of Bloomberg News. And speaking of big money, it's time for this week's big number, global private credit, which includes distressed debt and uh, venture financing ballooned to nearly $777 billion in 2018. By one estimate, the total is likely to top a trillion dollars in 2020. That does it for us. A reminder, you can catch us each Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London, 1 a.m. in Hong Kong. This is Bloomberg.